This 20th, conference will now be recorded. August 20th, 2020, Clatsop County Comprehensive Plan Update, Countywide Citizen Advisory Committee, and I'm Andy Davis, your chair, calling this meeting to order. Um, I want to ask first, are there any additions or changes uh, that you that any member would like to move to the agenda as presented today? Um, Gail, is it possible for you to, to show the agenda at the moment? Yes. Thank you. And I apologize, I do not have your meeting summary from uh, July prepared yet. So that would be one change we would need to make. Okay. Um, so without objection, uh, we, we will uh, take review of meeting summary off of the agenda and move immediately to uh, CAC liaison reports after introductions. Uh, any objection to that change? No. Okay. Seeing or hearing none, uh, Gail, we'll go ahead and skip that when we get to it. Uh, any other additions or changes that folks need to make? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll go into introductions. Um, I'll, I'll call off as, as I go along just based on um, the order I see on my screen, but my name is Andy Davis. I'm the chair of the Countywide Citizen Advisory Committee. I live in Astoria. Uh, Gail, do you mind introducing yourself? Gail Henriksen, Community Development Director. Thank you. Uh, I think it's Jim Coughlin. Are you on the line, Jim? I can be. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm, I'm attending today's meeting as uh, just informationally. Thank you. Thank you for joining me, Jim. Uh, Robert? Hello, everyone. I'm Robert Strickland, liaison from the Clatsop Plains Advisory Committee. Uh, and hi, Ashley. You look like you're sitting there next. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I I have Jed, though I don't I don't have a picture for Jed. Jed Arnold, are you on the line? Yeah, I am. Uh, my internet connection is unreliable, so I keep the video off uh, to make it a little bit less bandwidth intensive. Uh, this is Jed Arnold. I work for Hampton Family Forest, and I'm a county resident. Thanks, Jed. Uh, and then Todd Todd Lundy. Todd, I see your phone does not appear to be muted, but I'm not hearing you. I saw him there earlier. Yeah, I did too. Maybe he also has a connection issue. We should ask our commissioners to address that. Um, Ashley, how about now? Good afternoon. I'm Ashley LaTorre, Stewardship Forester from Oregon Department of Forestry. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for joining us. Nancy Ferber. Hi, this is Nancy. I'm a coastal planner at the Columbia River Estuary Study Task Force. So we do a lot of work around Goal 5 issues with wetlands and riparian corridors. So I'm just kind of listening in to see how we could potentially help you guys in the future navigate this policy. Thank you for joining us, Nancy. Uh, I'm going to skip Jim because he's standing up. Cheryl Johnson. Cheryl Johnson, I'm the CAC rep from Northeast County. And Jed, are you, are you out in Napa today? Is that why you have limited bandwidth? No, I'm working from home, uh, but uh, every summer my bandwidth gets mysteriously lessened. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if that has to do with the population jump we get in Astoria or not. Uh, Jim Allegria. I don't know if Jim can hear me. Jim, can you wave at us if you can hear me? <laughs> How about uh, Pat Corcoran? Yes, Pat Corcoran, a member of the Countywide Citizens Advisory Committee, and I live in Astoria. Thank you, Pat. And then uh, Susanna Gladwin, I do see your name now, FYI. Okay, yes. 
and I have a farm in Jewel. Thank you for Pat joining Penny us. Any resident, yes. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Susanna. I don't believe I've missed anyone, though. Jim, can you hear us now? I'm thinking he still cannot. Hopefully, uh, that audio issue will work out or he will be able to figure it out as we go. Uh, Gail, uh, I guess first question is, do we have a sufficient quorum to continue business for the day? Yes, there's not a quorum required because you won't be making any votes or taking any votes today, so you're fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, so since we're skipping, uh, and I don't believe I missed anyone, did I miss anyone that I can't see somehow? Okay. No, that's everyone. Thank you, Gail. Um, so we're skipping review of meeting summaries. So uh, how about the CAC liaison reports? Um, so this, I think we could do a, maybe a combination of members and then Gail, can you represent the, um, the CAC areas that don't have a member here today? If they've had a meeting anyway. Looks like uh, I've arrived. Hello, Todd. Hi, finally made it. Hi, Todd. Good. Actually, uh, we just finished introductions, but uh, do you mind introducing yourself as well, Todd? Yeah, I'm uh, Todd Lundy, and I have I'm the representative for the Southwest Coastal uh, Committee. Thank you, sir. Uh, glad you could get back on with us here. Uh, so, do we have a report from Clats of Plains CAC? The main thing that I was tasked to do. Uh, we came up with a suggestion for ourselves that we're sharing with everyone else. Um, Gail very niftily made a map that was an overlay of county-owned properties. Uh, there are roughly 470. This is down about 20 from, I think, earlier this, this year even when there were, I think, 490 something. Uh, that one overlay, plus the wetlands inventory. And the object being that maybe we might, in our little neighborhood groups, peruse those to see with our specific knowledge of the area, are there some of these that we feel ought to be specifically protected, you know, not sold by the county, but kept in county ownership. And and that was the uh, the the key. We have not done this yet. Uh, Gail whipped up the map uh, in less than a minute, uh, and I'm sure yeah, we'll make it available to everyone else. But the 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 recommendation was that each neighborhood group, area group, see what county owned wetland parcels there are that have value as such. You know, not, not so much development value, market value, but intrinsic wetland value. Period. Thank you, Robert. Actually, I think uh, is that information available to the committee as a whole, um, either from you or Gail. I think that's a an interesting idea for us to mull over. So the information is available on web maps. Anybody can look it up at any time. Um, what I'm have, doing right now for the Clots of Plains Committee is having GIS actually make them a map specific to their planning area and preparing a spreadsheet that identifies those county parcels within their planning area, along with the soil types. Um, and then I'm suspecting that there will probably be maybe between 50 and 100 of those parcels. And so the committee will need to go through there and look at those parcel by parcel to identify which they believe would be um, prime for extra protections. Okay. And I can, I can do that for each of the planning areas and then I can 
we can do one that covers the entire county with all 400 plus parcels for the county-wide group. Great, I, th I, I think that sounds like a useful uh, approach for, especially if we're, as you discussed a little pre-meeting, uh, if we're gonna take some more time with this process, I think that would be a nice tool for us to have available to us and at the, the CAC regional groups. Okay, uh, any other items from, from Clads and Plains, Robert? Uh, no, I think as we go through, there are uh, the predictable um, reactions that we care about wetlands, that the policies to preserve them should be clear, um, policies that came out of space, uh, we may wonder, do they belong? Uh, in this as policies, you know, or uh, they they may have history as to how they got there, but it, it was a, uh, I'm sure, a very supportive of wetland protection. Okay, thank you. Elsie Jewell, Seaside Rural, do, do we have a, a representative from that group at the moment, Gail? Uh, no, we do not. So they held their meeting uh, Tuesday of this week. They are having some issues uh, with retention of committee members. I think they are down to three and two of them were absent on Tuesday. So the uh, member that was present and there was one member of the public present, they did do an initial discussion of uh, wetlands and riparian corridors but I don't believe that much headway or, or uh, ground was covered during that meeting. Okay. Thank you for the update, Gail. I hope we can we can get some more interaction there. Um, Lewis and Clark. Um, they had their last meeting at the end of June, and the, their next meeting will be next week on the twenty seventh. Okay. I believe, yeah. Um, so at their last meeting, they basically went through all of the policies that were in goal five on the main worksheet that had been provided uh, mm -hmm. and went through the, many of their concerns centered around aggregate and mining and okay. uh, concerns about that uh, mines may not be properly zoned. Uh, so there's going to be some additional work that Julia will be doing with that group on aggregate and mining at this meeting coming up. Okay. Thank you, Gail. How about the Northeast CAC? Four of our five members were there. Um, the only um, guest that we had uh, was Jed Arnold, and we worked our way through the three wetlands policies that were presented, and we found ourselves in that situation again of having three policies, but having no goal for wetlands. So we uh, hacked around and put together a goal, um, which I hope Gail has written down coherently somewhere and that we'll be looking at um, a bit later. What we basically did was use policy one, most of the wording off of that, and then added a couple of, of phrases that we thought were important. So, so we have a, an overarching goal for wetlands. So that was uh, one of the things we got done Policy two, I'm sure Gail will um, work with us, is not particularly an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. Policy three is very interesting because policy three is in Northeast CAC. And we looked at that, none of us specifically had firsthand knowledge of it, but the way it was written, our sense is that it was written so carefully and so specifically particularly with protection of white-tailed deer in mind. And we felt that even though it was very detailed and it was very specific, that it should be retained. And as far as we know at this point, it should be retained as written. We talked a little bit about riparian. Um, none of us felt that we had enough expertise on riparian. And I think it was from our group, the idea of reaching out to Crest came up. So I'm glad that Crest is uh, on the line today and that they will be working with us in the future. I feel like they're just a, a very valuable resource that, that we should be taking advantage of. 
we did not have time to look at the recommendations from the county's ad hoc wetlands advisory committee um, that were written up in March of 2017, although that was part of our packet. And I am hoping that we have time to get to that today. Northeast CAC did not get to that one. And I think that's about it from us. And this idea of the map with the overlays of the wetlands sounds great. So Northeast CAC would like to have one of those maps also. That's it. Thank you, Cheryl. I, I am glad, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you did discuss policy three because obviously that is your area. And so having having you all discuss it is I think of, of special value. Um, Southwest Coastal, Todd? Hi, yes. Um, we met on the 12th and uh, just a little background, we have divided uh, goal five into seven quote buckets <clears throat> of related topics uh, and we discussed the first two which are wetlands and riparian corridors and the second one is watersheds and groundwater resources. Um, we adopted uh, proposals that were made by uh, Charles Dice and another set of proposals by Linda and I'm hoping those can be put up on the website uh, at some point so that others can see them because they're much too uh, too long to uh, describe here in the meeting. Uh, our September meeting will uh, concern buckets three through five, which are scenic and wild waterways uh, and natural and open spaces and wilderness areas and recreational trails. And then five is fish and wildlife habitat. So then that will leave the last two, uh, cultural and historical resources and energy sources and mining and aggregate resources for our, our October meeting. And it should leave enough time to kind of go over all of them. That's where we are. Great. Sounds well, like by the way, we also would like to have one of those wetland maps. Uh, one of the things that I was asked to mention is uh, the overriding concern expressed in this meeting was that wetlands are critical to the natural beauty and wildlife habitat of the Southwest Coastal Planning Area. Thank, thank you, Todd. Actually, a question for you. Uh, do you do you feel like you have a good command of the, um, the Arch Cape uh, inventory that was done uh, that if we come to that discussion, are you a good source for that? Uh, I, I just no no I'm probably not a real good source I I know of it and I uh, I know how it came about uh, but I don't know anything about the specifics of it okay that's fair I, I won't I won't put you on the spot then all right thanks okay um, any groups that we've missed Gail or or anything that we also should be aware of as far as the liaison groups uh, no, that would be all for the liaison groups. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, yep. Robert, did you have a uh, comment? Yeah, I just uh, that I, I may have been the main whiner about this, but on our classic plane discussion of the wetland, there were so many subcategorizations you know and uh, that seemed weird that when i look out my window it's all one kind or another of this water table that's either on the surface and whether you call it a creek, stream, lake, whatever, it really is just this vast water table that does move, so it's not really a bog, it's a fan, but that it, it seemed when we were slicing and dicing, there was not a whole lot of purpose to it. You know, when I'm looking out now, 
I know what I see used to be the wintertime lake bottom of Colby Lake, you know, which extended over all the way Hawkins Road and all this low-lying pasture land. And then all of that got dropped. But it's still basically all the same kind of Brawler, mucky peat, uh, deer heart, sand, dune swale pattern, and and it there isn't a whole lot of sense behind separately dealing with this whole. You know that that it doesn't really matter if East Fork of Neocoxie Creek. You know the people who have come in from the outside and studied it didn't know if it were flowing north or south. In Lewis and Clark days, it it flowed south next to 101. It just sits there because it's really just a water table. It depends on the time of year. So I the the short thing is. I would like to see us not get too wrapped up in the separations of what's a riparian area, what's a marsh, what's a, a lake, what's a water table, what's an aquifer, because it's basically anywhere you go out here, you can take a post hole digger and dig to the water table you know in different times of the year it's going to be uh surface water you know so it's that that's all i'm trying to say is that let's not slice and dice too much in thinking them as different landforms they're just it, it depends on the surface, the surface elevation. You know, and then that gets confusing because the water table drops about five feet every dune that you go east from from way out, you know, next to the ocean. Your your four dunes are around sixty feet elevation. Back here next to the hills, they're fifteen feet. You know, so it, it's a little counterintuitive. Important wildlife area, uh, whether this is because of the value of killing ducks or for the value of uh, a place for garter snakes. You know, it, it, it just, it, it's a wonderful natural area, but I, I, I think trying to cut it apart too much misses the whole. Hmm. So, uh, Gail, I might ask you a question that I think is related to that anyway. Um, is the descriptive nature of our requirements under um, 660, 16, whatever, um, when, we, when we're required to do the inventory, um, do, is that, binding or does that change our obligations in any way or is it just descriptive if we call something uh by what it is in the present when we see it today uh, as opposed to to what it may uh shift in and out of over time i'm not sure that a i completely understand your question but B, I'm not sure that I have the answer for that question. <laughs> okay. Well, so, so so part of what so what part of what I'm hearing from Robert is that that uh, the existing comprehensive plan and probably the the process that we're going through now may assign uh, a descriptive value to these wetlands resources that may or may not change over time. That may or may or may not be valuable in in and of itself uh, in partitioning these pieces of the wetland and giving them this narrative value right so that's what i'm is that accurate for what i'm hearing from you robert yes yeah, so when you when you go for example to camp rylea 
and turn left on Neocoxie Street. It is not pure coincidence that it's called Neocoxie Street or Road. That it's a, uh, you you can ask the, the geese, what is this? And uh, depending on the recent rains, they will tell you, well, it's obviously the, it's Neocoxie Creek. It has been filled in a little bit to make a good parade ground. Mm -hmm. But we know the reality that it, if you go directly north from there, it's the uh, water next to the officers' club, and we and we know that it's mowed. There is no riparian area that's left unmowed because you don't do that on a military base. Uh, so it's you know period. <laughs> Okay, so, so goal five is focused on freshwater wetlands. So mm -hmm. when you pull up the, the OAR and mm -hmm. it talks about wetlands, it does not make a differentiation or provide definitions for things like fens and bogs. Is that, I think, what Mr. Strickland is talking about? Um, I think that if the committees wanted to do that, then they would need, we would need to develop um, definitions if you want to get down to that level and define something as a fen wetland or a bog wetland or a semi-dry, semi-annual puddle wetland, uh, then we would need to um, figure out how to define those. And then that terminology would have to be used consistently throughout. So so that's just, I, I guess that's what I was targeting in my question was just oh, whatever name we set, uh, the boundary matters location matters um in in that if we set other requirements up or the state does around wetland protection for example the boundary matters but anything that we classify as a wetland or any sub classification we give within that is all the same according to the oar would it be exactly. dangerous to have a glossary Could it be dangerous to have a glossary? I don't know if who you're directing your question to. I would say not. Okay, okay. Jim, uh, I see a hand up. Uh, are you with us as far as audio now? Uh, I should. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Well, well, my comment is is pretty much along the lines that. Uh, the uh, OAR 660 uh, um, uh, states is that it's it's a wetlands according to uh, you can you can read it for yourself number two for especially um, and 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 oh, and one and two and to, in terms of subdividing it into specific types uh, we should only do that if we have a purpose of doing that only as if they're going to be treated differently. If not, then it should be classified as wetlands according to 660. You know, there may be certain reasons, there may be reasons to specify a, a fen, for instance, or a bog, because we want to make sure that the, uh, we want to add additional protection, then that's okay. But that would be more of the exception rather than the rule. And Robert, I, I think this should be sufficient for your needs as well, is that there's a, a definition about the standing water at certain times of the year. Vegetation is the key. Right? That is really the key to define it. And uh, of course, there is always some um, discussion uh, even among biologists about what is wetland vegetation or, or how much wetland vegetation is present in order to classify it as wetlands. They got they have literally species lists that would be associated with the wetlands. So that that's essentially what, what I would suggest is don't pause it if you don't have to. Uh, you know, I'm thinking that eutrophication is kind of a normal part of life on classic plains. So yeah, you know, I, I think it's great to be able to talk about that process. You know, uh, is is Smith Lake going to be walkable um, in the near future? And is that okay? Uh, 
like on on Cullaby. Uh, it may have recreational value as hydroplane place. Uh, yeah, I I think somehow we need uh, I I like the idea of wetland protection, but but if something is also a parade ground is also getting kind of filled in legally all the way from Sunset Lake down to the Neawana Estuary. Uh, how do we talk about this? You know, uh, it they they gradually, you know, I I think people at our North County North Class at meeting could recall having in childhood gone by boat long ways down to the Neawana Estuary from North Clatsop Plains. And 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 now you'd kind of get into arguments, you know, somewhere somewhere along there. And are are you running somebody's, you know, finding the path of Neocoxie Creek all the way from the officers club to an Aowana estuary uh, has a piece of contentiousness. You know, I, and I, I just think it's something where we ought to not squelch conversation about it. Uh, one of our North Clots of Plain members who, whom I've not had the pleasure of meeting is a colonel responsible for a lot of these things. And I don't know if he would like to protect the riparian areas around Neocoxie Creek next to the officer's club. I have no idea. I'm not going to guess. I, I, I know when I inquired about, gee, do we want to restore Neocoxie Creek under the parade ground, I, you know, I, I kind of wondered as a one, once upon a time West Pointer, uh, why in the 21st century do we need a parade ground? But this was also kind of a nasty question. You know, I, I, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing about, you know, uh, I, I just think we ought to be able to freely talk about these things without them being quite super hot topics because someone thinks we're going to stop their developing their swale uh, because it's where the viola adunca grows and that's the larval, larval food for the silver spot butterfly that we aren't supposed to talk about because Camp Arleo already got rid of silver spot butterflies by agreeing to do something else. You know, there have been so many trade-offs through a long time of how can we politely shut up about the aquifer, shut up about swales. You know, does someone need to know what a swale is to join the conversation? Well, I think that's where glossary might help. You know, well, it, it, well. Oh, Robert, if I could just uh, intercede here. What you're really talking about, inventory is just a first step uh, for identifying what the re uh, how much of a resource that you have. What you're talking about then is developing objectives, uh, monitoring, uh, and maybe possibly a threshold. So, uh, for instance, uh, the objective is to uh, maintain a habitat for a particular species, be a Colombian white-tailed deer or a spotted butterfly, you know, that that's one. Then you, you're talking about a monitoring uh, protocols and then possibly a threshold. If, if, if something goes below a certain point or above a certain point, then you will have an action. You know, the action may be the protection or you don't have to worry about it as much. Now that's, that's really a little bit, a little bit, a little bit separate. The topic. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's to, a little to bit... not talk about aquifer, to not talk about silver spots, 
you know, and I'm talking about as a as a applied policy and land use planning on classic planes, uh, those have been uh, find and delete those terms in any kind of studies that have been done. Well, I, I, I'm not sure if the proceed what have been has been the procedures in the past about deleting things from a comprehensive plan. Seems to me that there is a, Camp Rylea is a Defense Department, a federal uh, agency. Uh, they would have an opportunity to uh, comment on draft procedures, and then, uh, and then through either our process or the commission, the, the county commissioners' process, they can make a final determination whether to keep it or to to exclude it. I don't see our responsibility to essentially preempt or uh, make a uh, some type of a. a, a a priori decision and what should or shouldn't be in there. I mean, we should just define what we want to do, put it down there, and then and then let the public review and comment, uh, and then uh, be disposed of uh, eventually by the county commissioners. That was also Dirk Rohn's view of what business do we have telling the War Department uh, how to run their affairs? Well, uh, we clearly we clearly yes, can't yes. we. We clearly can't direct what the federal government can do on federal lands, because you know, this is uh, this yeah, is not really. Land. Oh, okay. But maybe we could. So, so I'm going to try and redirect this just a little bit here, um, Robert. I think those are those sound like valid concerns. I'm not trying to dismiss this at all. I think I don't uh, think that at all. I think, in fact, that. Um, one of the things Cheryl has brought up several times is, uh, and, and that Jim is referring to here, is a need for goals and uh, and specific language within Goal Five uh, to express both what uh, us as a committee and and eventually what the county commissioners might want out of Goal Five and how we treat this going forward to give direction to places like the planning department when these issues come up in the future. Um, what my, I, my my comments were purely directly from DLCD projects in in the past, yeah, you know, okay. such as rural problem solving. Okay. Uh, Can I, I comment? I, uh, just a second. Sorry, uh, Susanna. I'm. I also just got a, a question in chat that I needed to read real quick. Um, uh, so we're going to have public comment uh, before we go into the goal five comments, Susanna. And I might I might ask you to hold your comment for just a second. Um, okay. I I just want to encourage Robert uh, if if you have language for this uh, or or want us to take a specific step. Uh, I I want that to happen. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly I should do to or this group should do to uh, confront some of the issues that you're bringing up. So just, ha just ha have them in mind that uh, the, the pattern in the past has, has been to not talk about the aquifer because we've been able to get by with that. Now water is more of an issue. Hmm. Okay. You know, in other words, they're, they're just, it, it has been, you know, the Citizens for Sensible Land Use was created to make sure that the word silver spot did not exist in any product of the planning process. You know, it, it, these, I, I'm, I'm, I think the county gets what it deserves, but it, uh, it kind of needs to decide along the way um, uh, what do we want to smile sweetly and uh, ignore? You know, but 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 even Warrington has has now said no. You can't automatically have a water hookup, and this was never done in the past. So I think that's forever. totally fair, and I think it's reasonable that the rest of this group will keep those those issues in mind. I, I simultaneously think that if we want to ensure that people will keep it in mind in the future um, 
especially since staff and people that are involved with these committees and such change, uh, that we should think of some way to, uh, to put that language in if it's something we value. Um, that said, I, I do want to, I do want to sort of be conscious of, especially the fact that we're going to, um, I mean, we're okay on our agenda at the moment, uh, but I'd like to have as much this discussion time as possible, especially because we have this action list uh, for today that I appreciate, uh, but I think is going to be a challenge for us to get through. Um, so, Robert, if uh, with your blessing, I'd, I'd love to go to public comment. I, I bless you. Thank you. Um, Susanna, uh, I'll start with you for public comment. We'll, we'll take a few minutes here. Uh, if you could limit your comment to, uh, to three minutes. Or, uh, Jim, can I have you second after Susanna? It's your public comment today, right? Yes. Okay. So, Susanna, can we start with you? Yes. You know, somebody's garbling in the background, but um, my comments are when I looked at when I, I at a map, there was nothing in the Nehalem drainage that I could see for wetlands delineation. And the wetlands seem to be quite large areas. And <clears throat> I think of the Nehalem drainage as wetlands often <clears throat> just feeding into fairly close to the river and often either long and skinny or the mouths of creeks where they spread out some um, into the, the val Nehalem River Valley, but just none of the big areas of the coastal. And does that make any difference and could some of these areas be delineated out here. And I do understand that they go by soil type and vegetation. There's a, a list of identification requirements to ID a wetland. Um, and I so, think if speaking informally for my area out here, since we don't have representatives, that would be, I would like to see more discussion. Thank you, Susanna. Um, I, I think, especially when we get to the waterways section, that uh, 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 even of today's discussion, that may may come up. So um, we'll keep that in mind. Thank you, uh, Jim. Uh -huh. Did you have comment as well? Oh, you're muted at the moment, Jim. Sorry. Uh, if you're referring to me, I did not raise my hand. No, I was, uh, Jim Coglin. I will. I will. Uh, Am I back on board? Am I am I here? Yeah. Definitely. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Are you? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to thank all of you for continuing this process, particularly through uh, the issues that have come before us all. Uh, my wife and I have lived in the Lewis and Clark area on a two acre piece of RA uh, zoned piece of property that has riparian type uh, arroyos moving through it, sometimes streams. And we're at an elevation of about 35 feet. So we're, we're pretty much part of the of the ground surface water here, very, very, very much so. And the issue that I earlier today spoke with the chair of the Lewis and Clark committee group, Mike Magyar, uh, I, I asked him to come up with some way that zoning can be restored held held accountable so that effluence and those kinds of things aren't getting into our groundwater. Uh, you, you go around the county, there are many areas that I have taken pictures of that are situations where effluent is being dumped, 
whether it's petroleum products or antifreeze products. And this is going directly into the Lewis and Clark River and the groundwater here. Uh, that needs to be addressed and it, and it needs to be paid for in some manner that goes back on the offending property owner. Uh, I, I don't see any way that quality of life and quality of environment can continue with, without some sort of an enforcement in place. And there must be a place to put that in, in this future plan. <clears throat> I, I think that's what I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Cogan. Are, are there any other comments from the public? Um, we have a couple other members of the public with us. Do any of you wish to speak? Okay, hearing or seeing none, I think we can move on to the review of goal five topics. Um, I do want to note in your packet today, and, and I'm going to let Gail speak a little bit because we have some things about logistics of goal five that she wanted to go over. Um, but I just want to note that on page two of your packet, uh, we have a list of six action items for today's meeting um, that staff suggested for us to to work, work through um i think that this is a this is a nice framework for us to work from uh today uh and I, i'm sure gail may give us more guidance on that but i just want to make sure that everybody sees those before we get into the the meat of this um gail did you want to talk about the logistics and and what you were saying earlier about uh maybe moving into more meetings for goal five Yes. Um, so based on the feedback that we've gotten, uh, including at the Northeast Committee meeting last week, which Cheryl mentioned, uh, staff met with Crest last uh, two days ago to talk about uh, some work that they could do uh, with county staff to help us focus this process and um, focus the process. And so to that end, uh, what we have talked about as staff and that we're going to be proposing um, is to extend our discussion time on goal five because there is so much to cover and it's very complex and very weighty and covers a variety of topics so we are looking at extending our discussions out through march of next year which would give us a very long time yeah, probably yeah, not so, long enough probably sorry not to, yeah sorry to interrupt can you can you zoom in on that uh spreadsheet a bit it's it's uh, not legible for me anyway. Thank you. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. whoops. So what we would be looking at, um, there are, let me just go back for a second here. Um, so within goal five, uh, there are items that we are required under uh, administrative rule to inventory, and then there are items, resources that were uh, encouraged to inventory. So among the required inventories, we're supposed to be reviewing riparian corridors, wetlands, wildlife habitat, federal and scenic rivers and state rivers, groundwater resources, recreational trails, natural areas, wilderness areas, mineral resources, energy resources, and cultural areas. And then we're also encouraged, but not required uh, to inventory historic resources, open space, scenic views, and sites. So, um, what we have been talking about as staff, first of all, is uh, again, keep these in smaller pieces so that we're not trying to cover all of goal five in three months. Uh, what we will be doing as staff is bringing to you the inventories that are in the comprehensive plan right now, plus an in inventories of what we have been able to identify as resources um, for each of these items. So in September, for example, um, the packet that you'll get will include an inventory of known to me, not me personally, but what I have been able to ascertain from National Register or SHPO um, in terms of an inventory of cultural and historic sites. And then uh, reviewing the policies and the comprehensive plan associated with that and identifying additional 
cultural or historic sites and policies that need to be added. And we're going to be breaking that down month by month. In the meantime, uh, we're going to be working with Cross behind the scenes to do some more work on developing uh, a bit more cohesive and up-to-date inventory of wetlands and also to uh, put together a working definition of riparian corridors and to identify where those are in the county so that uh, you can, as your committees, create policies and identify and prioritize the ones that um, should be protected or addressed or have policies associated with them. So that um, means that we're going to keep working on goal five, but we're going to circle back to wetlands and riparian resources back again in March of 2021, once we have that information from Crest. And they will not have their um, work done on that until probably January. Most of their time right now is field work, so their staff will be back in office for the most part starting in September and October, and then they'll begin that work. So. There is still more opportunity to think about this and provide input, and hopefully by the time we get to March and we've gotten our information from Crest, then um, we'll have uh, better information to provide you with to guide your discussions. And I'm happy to answer any questions. So Gail, does this, uh, the schedule that you've got up on screen now, does this suggest, so uh, is this an overlay on, the other items that we would have otherwise been discussing in those time periods, like for example, March when we're, when we're bringing in wetlands again, are we also discussing a different part, different goal in that meeting as well, or will that be exclusively wetlands and riparian resources? It will be exclusively wetlands and riparian resources. Okay. Does this affect the total timeline of the comprehensive plan uh, advisory yeah. committee work? Yes, it does. It'll probably extend it by another six months, which will put us into June of 2023. Does that hmm. does that butt up in, against any uh, regulatory requirements for the timeline? Uh, no, it does not. There is no regular regulatory requirement for the work that we're doing now. Uh, periodic review was. Uh, eliminated by the state in 2007. So this is a completely voluntary uh, project that we've undertaken. Okay. And does that butt up against any of you all and your expectations of how much time you would be giving to this committee? I would suggest uh, speaking now uh, as we have the chance to uh, gently nudge this process in a different direction if you desire it. I think it's a matter of lifespan. <laughs> I, might I, know. I think a sustained effort is better than a timeline. So, and the reason, it's not that staff wants to prolong this any longer than it already is. Um, you know, it's an investment of our time as well as your time. But with the feedback, and, and the quality of the discussions that we've been having at some of the uh, citizen advisory committee meetings, even though staff has laid out action items and specific things that we would like the committees to address, uh, there have been a lot of detours and um, I'll say rabbit holes for lack of a better word. And I, we're not feeling that people are understanding what it is that they want to, are, are, are tasked to do. Um, so we're trying to make it presented in, in pieces that are digestible and manageable because I understand that everybody's time is valuable and people are often overwhelmed these days and there, there's a lot of stress in people's lives. So we're happy to keep it at the current time frame and just leave goal five at three months if, if we can have every group focus on the um, policies and what needs to be revised. However, the feedback that we're getting um, is that people want more information, they want to go deeper into the subject matter. It's really your direction to staff as to how you would like to proceed. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Um, Jim Allegria, I saw you came off of mute, and then I think Susanna, you might have wanted to speak to. Yes. Uh, no, I, I just wanted to say that um, if I would like to see a good pro uh, process rather than a fast process. Uh, so um, if 
if uh, Gail, you think it would take an additional six months, I'm fine. Uh, my only question is, do you have to clear that with the uh, with the county commissioners? We do a, an update with the county commissioners. They did not approve the timeline, so we we did the initial timeline when we started the project in February of 2019. Um, we we have given them updates throughout. We presented them earlier this month with the revised uh, time frame at a work session. So they will be kept apprised of what we're doing, but th they are not required, nor have they, they can choose to, I guess, but in, so far to date, they have not um, approved an official timeline and required that that not that be immutable, so. Okay, all right, thank you. Let's go. I have a question. Uh, to, uh, is it related yeah, to the uh, timeline, Todd? Uh, Gail, am I on? Yes, you are. Uh, Gail, uh, how will this affect uh, the the worksheets that you send out, the, the 11 by 17 worksheets? So the goals or the policies that are listed on those worksheets do not change because they are the ones that are already in the comprehensive plan. What we've been doing, so for example, for this meeting, um, we pulled out the policies specifically related to wetlands for today's discussion, uh, but the, the policies are still the same. And um, if there are groups and committees that want to move faster than this process, uh, we can certainly accommodate that. So if Southwest uh, completes their work and feel that they've addressed everything they want to address for goal five, and they do it in four months or three months, um, then we uh, certainly can move that group on to goal six. Uh, we've been trying to keep all the groups together, um, but yeah. again, we're every group is at a very different level, and we, you know, as I discussed, the LC Jewel group um, has had problems with membership retention. This week, we had one person in attendance at the meeting. Um, other groups are fairly regular in their attendance, and the, um, so it, we're trying to accommodate six different levels of six different levels. And um, you know, I, I'm happy if you all have suggestions about how we can make this better. Cut cut down the time if you want to make it longer. I just need to understand what will help me help you go through this process, especially in relationship to this particular goal. I have, I have two points. Uh, one is that it seems to me that what we're seeing in our meetings is that those individuals who have specific things they're concerned about uh, get right into that topic and uh, and can carry the discussion and so on. The rest of us that don't may not have anything specific or uh, experience with that topic sit back and so it becomes kind of a one-man show or one-woman show this is in our group uh, so it would be advantageous to slow it down and to let everybody uh, stay on the same page and learn the same kind of background and besides which second point is that these meetings of the county-wide uh, group would be chaotic if we were all dealing with different things Thank you. I agree. Um, Pat, I do see you. Uh, Susanna was waiting in queue, um, and so I'm going to let her uh, speak up and then come back to you. So oh, I'm on? Yes, please. Okay. I just want to comment on my area that I noticed that some of the people that have been on the commission don't know the whole planning process and I think we're quite overwhelmed with it and it's a you know if you've never been involved it's quite something and uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I should apply again but my, my my name was stricken from the list when the county commissioners voted on the list as a total of number of names I never could understand all that was about, but I don't know if I can apply or not anyway. Just those two comments, that's all. Thanks, Susanna. Uh, Pat? 
Okay, so as I'm thinking about this, both from process and content, and it seems like um, for me, where we would all probably make better traction and really what we do well is talk about emerging issues and concerns. What we're what we're what we're tasked to do is is turn policy and goal language into words, and um, this is something that I know staff is already working huge on this project. This might be another crest contract, but what might be helpful is as I look at my my big worksheet, um, if there was fake language, draft language, um, possible like maybe left, right, center, something that would be sort of hmm, language that staff would generate because it's the kind of language that's gonna have to kind of come out anyway. And I realize I don't wanna be led by staff, but I think many of us struggle with not, it's like putting a cat into a bathtub to get us actually to talk about ordinance language and policy and words. And I'm wondering if there was a pace and lead with some staff suggestions about alternatives that might even be sort of left, right, center, or whatever it would be politically to make that not relevant. But that might help me see the type of language for the type of policy that I could help um, uh, focus that already drafted language on to tweak it based on my sense of the county. I realize that's yet another step for staff, but I'm wondering if staff's time spent on getting quorums into the room might be addressed by actually uh, having it more multiple choice on the worksheets like I'm suggesting to engage people enough that they can focus on I think what staff really needs and that that extra step might help us get you what you need in a shorter period of time. Even those two questions goal met yes no rectangle yes no you know that is uh is one of those multiple choices that you have. Yeah, and I think. Uh, yes, I know, but I would love on recommended changes. I could see, you know, policy options, you know, one, 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 you know, uh, and then you could whatever kind of uh, policy narratives that would be. I'm trying to like not make it be prescriptive, like staff is telling us what to do, but could put into specific language discrete options that we might then talk about and annotate and at least start with sort of staff bona fide words and language and sentences that we can then mangle, rather than trying to come up with that originally. Um, I think it might help us get off the ball, maybe not. Uh, Gail, hearing that suggestion, is, is that something that you think would be helpful or possible for staff? Um, it definitely would be possible. I know internally we've discussed it as well, and the reason we initially rejected it is for the very reason um, Patrick mentioned, is that we don't want to be seen as staff to be leading the discussion on this. So, um, but it is something that we could do. Can I comment? Yes, go for it, Suzanne. Um, I would love to have a list of people to send it to either the um, the watershed councils, somebody like Mike Manzuli, of just see if they would be interested in the topic that the county has suggesting some wording and see if they would be willing to comment too for their wording. So you're suggesting that we get um, feedback from community groups that, that might have interest in the affected area uh, to go along with staff suggestions? Yes, I mean, specifically right now, the wetlands and riparian were the mm -hmm. people I mentioned. It would be different maybe for other topics, but sure. yeah. I'm also looking for to talk about what the ad hoc committee came up with because I was pleased to see that a group fairly recently worked through this and had some recommendations that you know may well help us move forward in this conversation too. Yeah, I agree. I think that was that was a helpful item. Um, Gail, I think uh, if if that's possible as a suggestion, we uh, and and your staff is happy to do that. Maybe we could test drive that in, in our next discussion just to see how it would work if, if we got some some sample policies, or I think especially uh, like with what you've got up on the screen now, 
uh, this group or uh, the liaison groups have identified that goals are, are a missing element perhaps of, um, of goal five section, right? Uh, and that's obviously language intensive. Uh, if staff was willing to suggest some goals for the sections, since uh, we're going to have to invent them out of whole cloth, or you know, I think um, that might be helpful. This one we happen to have some suggested language. I assume that came out of uh, Northeast, but I don't know. Um, but I think that that would that would be a nice way to test that. Okay. Duly noted, and we will do that for the next agenda package. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I would like to try and, and move us into, um, welcome Commissioner Thompson. Uh, I would like to try and move us into the action items for today uh, so that we can try and move through this. Um, we are conscious of the fact that we've got about an hour and a half left. Um, I, I, want to, I want to start with a, a question though for Gail. Uh, number one is the inventoried wetlands. Uh, review uh, that seems like a valid thing for us to do but uh, conscious of the schedule that you just showed us is it better for us to cover that when we get feedback from crest about uh, the information on those wetlands i think that you can do a little bit of both uh, we do have this map in the comprehensive plan now that identifies uh, nine different wetland sites even though seven of them of them are only shown on the map. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, if you could um, you know, review this map and determine whether or not the sites and they're described in further detail on the following pages in your agenda package, whether those are still appropriate sites that should continue to remain on the inventory. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to ask a couple of procedural questions bef before we really get into this, because this is one of the first times we've been asked to to do this sort of review process. Um, so we had uh, obviously you gave us uh, 660. The language for that uh, establishes some things about how we would uh, make these determinations to begin with. I didn't see, perhaps I missed um, language around. Uh, what criteria to use in redeterminations or reviews? Uh, is that language in there? And I just didn't see it. Review, how to how what the process should look like in, in reviewing these? So the process is the same. It's, it's going okay. to be the same process. So, so uh, attached question. Uh, so all of the items that are in the current inventory, it appears to me. Uh, that their uh, determination was made uh, on the basis of uh, their inclusion in um, having to look up the 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 actual uh, document that they they used about the significant shoreland and wetland habitats of Clats of Plains. Um, that thank you for bringing that up. Um, we, as far as I know, do, uh, we don't have a parallel document to to draw from immediately today. Uh, do you do you have something that you could offer to us that would supply us with parallel data? I do not. We have not updated this report. It was completed in 1982, um, so that is part of the work that we've asked Crest to work on. Uh, we've asked them to do an a high level view of the wetlands throughout the counties and then to uh, go down and identify uh, what they believe are significant wetland I, and I'm not using significant in the in a uh, technically correct term what they would identify as important or notable wetland areas that the county should focus their attention on okay thank you uh, that's the limit of my sort of procedural questions. Uh, I see Robert and then Cheryl. Uh, somewhere in the section down further down, uh, there was a mention of there having been signs of agriculture having existed in the wetlands east of Gearhart. Uh, 
this won't last two minutes. Uh, one of those clues is the name of the road, McCormick Gardens Road. Uh, you can't Google it and learn anything about that. But uh, with my genealogical bug, uh, the 1910 census does show the Hugh McCormick family down there. Uh, and he was an immigrant from Belfast. Uh, who was born about 1861. So obviously he, uh, he was a farmer uh, in that area. And, you know, so, so there's this remnant evidence of, yes, there used to be agriculture there, why it's called McCormick Gardens. Uh, but uh, his, his wife, Lucy, uh, died in 1919 and they all moved to the Willamette Valley. But that's, that's just one of those curiosities of, where where this has a dead end, you know, that barely mentions, yeah, there's glimpses of agriculture having occurred, but that that's the whole story. Yes, McCormick Gardens Road was named after Hugh McCormick from Belfast, uh, and he had farms along McCormick Gardens Road, east of Deerhart. And that's, that's brought up because it's in this you know, I'd, I'd have to do a search for it. it his name isn't there, but the uh, agriculture uh, in the wetlands east of Gearhart is a topic here where, where little was known in 1980. And even now with the benefit of Google, nothing is known except this nice Irish family was there. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Cheryl. <clears throat> Majority of these designated wetlands are in the Clots of Plains area, but one site nine on our list, but it looks like it's seven on the map, um, is in the Northeast CAC. And so, Gail, I mentioned it last time, but now I'm going to formally request it. Um, I would like to do a field trip there. And I know nobody wants more work to do and nobody wants more time but this one is 360 acres which makes it the largest one in the whole thing and if i'm the only person who shows up on the field trip that's okay <laughs> and i don't mean to take up staff time but if we could figure out a, a, a time to do that then we would invite the rest of the folks from northeast cac and we can invite anybody else from the countywide cac and i need to walk that land, I need to see where that land is. Um, and I don't know who would be best to do that. Possibly county staff doesn't know it well enough or why it's designated wetlands. Um, and so possibly someone from Crest. And I don't know if we can throw it to Nancy for a minute. I don't wanna take us off the agenda. I don't wanna go down any rabbit holes. <laughs> so I am requesting a, a field trip to this one and if someone from Crest is the best to do that, that would be great. It's a huge mess down there, you know, uh, and, and you often can't see, you know, down there where I think Adair, yeah, I, I don't know if that was the street, but that whole area west of a dune down there, uh, east side of 101 in Gearhart, if you look over that dune, those wetlands go on and on and on. And it used to be Mackey family owned it. I, I don't know who currently does, but Robert, it's, the one that it's I... not some place you would be apt to want to go walk. Robert, the one you know, there's that I'm a requesting... lot of swamp land. Mm -hmm. Robert, the one that I'm requesting is site nine on our list and it's um, Driscoll Slough between Wanamill and oh. Westport. And I was just on the ferry recently, and I have some knowledge of that area, but 360 acres is a lot of acres. And, and then as we talked about before, policy three as written has ABCD, has very specific protective language written in it. So that Driscoll Slough, Marsh, Wanamill, Westport, that's the one that I'm requesting for field trip. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah. I, I'm a thought you meant south of Calabi. 
Gail, do you think that's a reasonable request for either for, um, well, for information for both this group and for the Northeast CAC? So if that is the request of the committees, then I think that we need to offer it to all the committees. Uh, the property appears to be owned primarily by uh, Georgia Pacific. So we would need to coordinate with them because it is not county owned property. So we would need to have their permission and they would probably want to have a guide for us. Um, we would need to figure out how to accommodate this in terms of public meeting requests, taking minutes, making sure that the public is able to come while still accommodating social distancing and mass gathering requirements because uh, even though people may have forgotten, there is still a pandemic. But we can definitely make it work. Uh, it may mean that we have to take each uh, committee member individually, but we're still gonna have to open it up to the public because these are public meetings. Um, you are a public group and we will need to take minutes and make sure that those get posted and then we would need to advertise. I wonder to what extent just a satellite view up close would suffice. Um, Cheryl, I see your hand again. Holy catfish, Gail. I did not mean to complicate life that much. I withdraw my <laughs> official request. I will try and find someone who can help me walk that property and understand it. Yeah, for you to post it publicly and take us in there individually, I nor no one else needs to double your your work. I withdraw my request. Thank you for that discussion. Okay, so so what I would like to do with the uh, with the permission of the group. Uh, is to go through so we have nine sites uh as gail said seven of them were on the the map that she was showing uh from the uh original comprehensive plan uh within the packet uh there is a rundown of them on uh, i think it's on page five of your packet uh, and then descriptions of them starting uh, on page 15 which is immediately after the map um, I'd like to just go through the list, and uh, I'm I'm open to procedure here uh, from the group. But uh, my inclination would be uh, that uh, if we do, if we have have a reason to strike a wetland from this section, uh, that we should speak up about it. If we don't have prevailing reason to strike it. Uh, that as far as we know, it's still a wetland and still has some significance that we should keep it in. Um, Jim, I do see your hand, uh, but I'd like to just go through these one at a time and 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 see if there's significant reason that we know of before we hear back from Crest to take these out. Uh, Jim Allegria, did you have comment? Uh, yes, well, I, I would actually suggest we not do that at this time. We wait until an explicitly asked Crest to review these sites and then have a discussion after we get the report from or get some findings from, from Crest, and then we can have a more intelligent discussion. I'm happy enough with that as well. Can, you, uh, can I ask you to rephrase that as a motion? Uh, well, um, I motion that we delay discussions on the uh, wetland sites in the 1980 draft until we get a report back from Crest. Okay. Uh, is there a second for that motion? Um, I, I think I saw Todd's hand go up first. So I'll take Todd as a second. Um, so. I'm just going to do this uh, with unanimous consent. Uh, Nancy, I, I think we're okay. Uh, we could have gone either way, I think, but um, I got a parliamentary procedure question in chat. Um, so uh, without objection to that, uh, I'll take uh, Jim's motion and Todd's second uh, to uh hold off on uh discussion and decision making on on these items until we have heard back from crest with more detail so that we can have a more intelligent discussion 
Uh, is there any objection to us taking that course of action? Robert? Yeah, I, I vote nay is all. Yeah, I, I think we can have an intelligent discussion. We can have additional intelligent discussion. But, you know, this is, you know, I think I think we could quickly look at it, and if we want to talk about it further after Crest has spent their several hundred dollars to update it, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, since since we do have an objection, uh, we can go to to vote and discussion. Um, any any discussion on any further discussion on the motion? I'm not seeing further discussion. Uh, let me, I think I can see everyone who's a voting member. Uh, so let me say, uh, can I get hands for those in favor of the motion to uh, delay discussion and uh, approval of these sites until we have heard back from Crest? Uh, those in favor, uh, please raise your hands. Okay, and those in favor, uh, those not in favor, uh, those wishing to go ahead and have discussion today. Okay. Uh, and Pat, I did not see a hand from you. Is that correct that you're abstaining? No, I'm sorry. I'm fine with that. Okay. You're fine with what? I'm with the motion. I support the motion. Okay. So uh, with Pat's vote, I, I have four to one. Uh, the motion is approved. Uh, we'll delay discussion, I would assume, until uh, March uh, would be the appropriate time when we get uh, the report back from Crest. And Gail, uh, just to make sure uh, we're not failing any requirement at this point uh, outside of not following the action items for the August 20 meeting. Correct. Okay. Okay, so the uh, number two action item uh, it lists the existing policies addressing wetlands in Goal 5 of the Comprehensive Plan need to be reviewed to verify whether those policies should be removed, retained, or amended. Uh, in your packet, uh, those are on, I believe it's page seven, seven or eight. Uh, Gail can bring the page up now. Um, thank you, Gail. Uh, so as noted in earlier discussion, we have only three existing policies, uh, though she has brought up the suggested wetlands goal. Um, I might uh, I might like to entertain discussion of the three existing policies first and then come back to that wetlands goal um, after after we've discussed the other three. Um, any objection to that? And seeing none. So uh, policy one, policy one reads, the county will protect identified significant freshwater low wetlands for which no conflicting uses have been identified from incompatible uses. Uh, so there's two basic questions on the worksheet that we have, uh, whether or not we met the goal and whether or not we should retain that goal. Um, so, I will I will note that uh, staff note here uh, refers us to the goal uh, that the, and I assume that's staff recommendation or is that recommendation from Northeast? That's from the Northeast. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Northeast is suggesting that we do not retain this policy and that we instead substitute the wetlands goal. Am I reading that correctly? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, is this goal met? I think uh, so. That's the first question to ask. Is this a? Th I feel that this is an open-ended goal. Is it ever uh, met in a sense? That's a question for the group, really. I do hiccup when, you know, for the phrase, you know, for which no conflicting uses have been identified, that seems to be just a huge loophole bit of language. I don't, am I tracking the conversation, Andy? Yes. 
Okay. And so it seems like it's a boilerplate and I get the intent. Um, but I mean, if there were no conflicting loose uses, we would have much more free time between now and 2023. It seems like, um, you know, conflicting uses is what we're supposed to kind of engage in and not avoid. Um, it, it does seem like sort of boilerplate language and I maybe don't want to make too much of it, but you get my drift. Um, I, I see a hand from Jim and Cheryl. Cheryl, was yours uh, germane to Patrick's comment? Or was yes. It? Okay, go ahead. If we can, if we can have that policy one back again, Gail, or maybe not. Okay. Um, two points. Number one, it, it is very general, and where Andy was going is that no, this goal is never met. Therefore. It has, no, it has not been met yet. Does it need to be retained? Yes, always. It's it's very broad. It's very general. The county will protect. Um, so it's an important one. And then that exact question about for which no conflicting uses have been identified was the exact question that I asked last week in the Northeast CAC. And Gail had a good way of clarifying it and explaining it, which hopefully she will do for us now. And then you can see that that what we did in the Northeast CAC was take this policy number one and roll it into the wetlands goal. So if we dump this goal, then we may wanna keep policy one, but if indeed we keep this goal as written or as amended, then it would fold policy one into it and, and then policy one becomes redundant. But um, if Gail wants to explain no conflicting uses. I, uh, I happen to agree with Pat that the uh, have been identified in policy one is it is a, uh, a stopper for me. Uh, it means that historically they were identified, but uh, we don't, we're not going to consider any that are identified subsequent to now. Thanks. Thank you, Todd. Um, Gail, do you want to go into, and Jim, I'll, I'll, I will still get to you. And... Okay. So the, the language specifically that talks about identifying conflicting uses comes out of OAR 660. 2340 and there is a decision making process that you we should all be using when we look at um, significant resources and there are four things that you're supposed to be looking at you're supposed to identify uses that conflict or could conflict with that resource uh, you have to determine the impact area you have to analyze um, and I always put the ease out of order the economic social environmental and energy consequences uh, that could result from your decision and, um, and we got developing a thing for goal five. So that language is actually coming out of state administrative rules, which is why it's included in the comprehensive plan. And um, when you look at conflicting uses, um, I'm, I'm not going to use the same example I used with Cheryl because I don't think that's a good one actually. But um, Well, I could tell you what it is. So um, what you're really trying to do is, you, you're, you, part of it is you want to protect the resource from surrounding land uses. And the example I used with Cheryl and the Northeast group last week um, related to the cranberry bogs around Delmore Loop, but I don't think that's actually the correct example that I should have given. So I'm just gonna stop there. But the, the reason why that language is in there is because it's part of state's um, administrative role. Thank you for trying to clarify that, Gail. Um, Jim Allegria, uh, you had your hand up earlier. Yes, uh, if, if you could go back to the uh, wording of the, of the goal of the policy, I should say. Okay. Uh, oh, it is a goal. All right. Uh, I would suggest it be a two-step situation uh, because for my interpretation, how it's reading, all you'll end up getting is a product of the non-conflicted wetlands. You don't know how much of the wetlands have conflict. So my suggestion is somehow word it maybe as a sub-goal sub, sub -goal or, uh, is that you have 
a, a wetlands inventory, which is complete, regardless if it's a conflict or not, and then some kind of an overlay to identify conflicting use. That way there you'd be able to see and monitor over time how much of the wetland area has uh, at maybe trend over time, mm -hmm. you'll have more conflict as time goes on. So it's just more informative, especially into the future. So, and it, it, it abides by the goals as written. It's just a little bit more information would be available. Yeah, I agree. So Jim, I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I beat a dead horse on this one, uh, but is it possible for you to, to make a motion or suggest language for, for that? Uh, I, that sounds like a valuable idea to me, um, but I'd like for us to have discussion and possibly a vote on that if, if it's possible. Um, it's a, a question for Gail is whether or not we could have like sub goals that uh, is a step by step process like uh, the overarching goal is to identify freshwater wetlands then as a sub uh, or as maybe as a second goal or a sub goal, a subset of it would be to identify conflicting interests and the third would be the the net result. That, at least that's how I would so, approach it. I don't know how it translates into policy though. So I don't wanna step on Gail's toes here, but I want to say that it would be my interpretation that this is the county's document and that we can set it up in whatever way we choose. If we choose to have a step stepwise process that we can do that, we're not, we're not in conflict with, uh, with OAR by doing that, I don't think Gail. Well, the OAR describes the the process that I understand um, Jim to be describing that he would like to see in the comp plan is a process that you should be using now as you're identifying your resources. Yes. So basically, you, yeah. you want to lift the administrative rule and uh, put it in as a step by step into the comp plan? Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, Todd, I see a finger up there. Yeah, I have a question. It's just for my education. Uh, will we be covering brackish and saltwater marshes and wetlands uh, subsequent to this uh, to Goal 5? And if not, why aren't we covering it then in Goal 5? So Goal 5 addresses freshwater wetlands. When we get to Goals 16 and 17, we'll be dealing with coastal shorelands and we'll also be de dealing with uh, estuarine wetlands. So you will have okay. your chance then. So that's good. Thank you, Gail. Um, Jim, can I pester you again? It, would it be possible for you to uh, say, even in the chat window, uh, type out suggested language so that we can accurately uh, get the ideas as you're communicating yeah now that i think about it you could actually keep what you have there but underneath that as sub bullets then you you uh itemize the uh steps identify significant wetlands identify incompatible uses uh and, and then uh, arrive at the uh the net uh, the net wetlands with without conflicting uses I like the idea of the county will protect significant freshwater wetlands as identified in the statewide wetlands inventory as a standalone sentence. And I think that supports what Jim just said to add on to that. It seems to be mixing a little bit of like goal and ordinance language to kind of have the for know which conflicting uses um, combined in that sentence to my ear. Okay. so. So I wanna resolve a couple of things here. So we've got a, a goal with some additions from Jim that is uh, typed in and suggested above. Uh, we will need them uh, procedurally. We'll, I would like something uh, to show that, that we have, uh, that this is what we want, if that's what we want. Uh, we also still need to make a decision on policy one. So I'm gonna try and roll us back a little bit here and ask, can can we as a group give feedback on whether policy one uh, is something we want to retain? Uh, you know, if you've got the plan in, in your head that we want to go with goal one instead of policy one, that's fine, but we'll have to get rid of 
or we should get rid of policy one if, if they are duplicative. Uh, Robert? Uh, you're muted, sir. I was eliminating my dog bark earlier. The I do not have my head fully wrapped around our leaving out. Yeah, you know, I understand we we deal with it under estuary rain, but it seems like in our environment, the brackish water wetlands are a huge part of you know they, they aren't a subordinate piece of uh, our salmonid interests you know it, it just it is i don't know if there's another way to slice and dice where uh where we aren't saying in this goal that we have no interest in saline wetlands you know, it, 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 it seems like like they're they're cast off to you know a dozen goals later, uh, and it just I'm just wondering is is there another way to view this where we're not discriminating against uh, wellings that are important to baby salmonids? So, so I, I I just want to quickly note that um, that one of the OARs uh, it's the the last one in in our packet for today uh, does um, specify that sixteen supersedes five um, in huh. in the state classification. So that may be um, the root of why we're putting that off. Gail, did you weird? Uh, Todd, yeah. I'd like. I move that we adopt uh, Jim's uh, proposal uh, in lieu of we change the name from a goal to policy. It's the same language, and substitute his for policy one, thereby eliminating the old policy one and having a new one. Okay. Is there a second for that motion? Okay, I see a second from Jim. Uh, so let's have let's have a discussion on that one. I don't want to go straight to a vote because it's a. Can we state the motion again? I, I'd be happy to. So uh, the motion, as I understand it, is to strike policy one and uh, to insert uh, wetlands goal uh, as written and present on our screen at this time. Uh, the county will protect. Uh, significant freshwater wetlands as identified in the statewide wetland inventory for which no conflicting uses have been identified from incompatible uses. Oregon's wetlands and their ecosystems are a highly diverse resource that reflects the physical and biological variability of the state. Streamside wetlands in the coast range provide food and shelter to threatened juvenile salmon and trout. Identify significant wetlands, identify conflicting uses, arrive at net wetlands. So that's the suggested language uh, discussion. Pat, I see your hand. Um, I'd like input from staff as to whether it is uh, possible to put a period after inventory and striking for which no conflicting uses, realizing it's gonna come under unidentified conflicting uses. Or is that some legal language that we just have to leave in there? I mean, if it is, let me know, but it seems like it's an unnecessary um, something. Uh, Gail, do you have staff feedback on that discussion point? If you are giving staff feedback, I don't hear you yet, Gail. I think I mentioned that we'd lost her, maybe. Uh, can we move the from compatible uses up so the county will protect from incompatible uses significant freshwater wetlands? 
you know, instead of just it's having simpler it. Just, it's simpler just to say, well, protect significant freshwater wetlands, period. I mean, as identified in the inventory, is extra, sure. but okay, period. Conflicting uses, yes or no, I think we've identified to be a subsequent step, not a goal language. So, so a couple of a couple of things to, uh, procedurally, which I think might simplify this a little bit, is uh, you guys have both suggested essentially amendments to this language, which I think is great. We should uh, amend this language if necessary, um, but I might ask that you do it in that form. I hate to be a stickler for form, but um, you know, if you want to strike language, uh, Pat, like uh, the comma offset section, uh, go for it. Uh, suggest it as an amendment, and and then we can decide as a group if that's uh, legitimate or not. All right, I move that we strike, we put a period after inventory and strike the rest of that sentence. Um, okay. Period. Okay, is there a second for that motion? Yes. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, so the motion is, uh, to strike the language for which no conflicting uses have been identified from incompatible uses. There is discussion now though, right? Yep, so uh, if if the group wants discussion, so is there any discussion of that motion? Cheryl, you have your hand up. Oh, you're muted, Cheryl, sorry. All right, I really like how this uh, goal, which I think we just decided is going to be a policy again, but it's all right. I like where this is going. Um, I really appreciate that Jim broke that process down for us. I appreciate the three subtexts that are down below. Um, and I appreciate that we now have for which no conflicting uses have been identified for incompatible uses. I am feeling good about this wetlands goal, which I think we're deciding as a policy. And it was my group who originally suggested this wording, this direction. I am in strong support of it as written, as amended. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Any any further discussion on the amendment? Okay, um, I'm gonna do this with, uh, try to see if, is there any objection to the amendment? Uh, to strike comma for which no conflicting uses have been identified comma from incompatible uses. Any objection to striking that language? Okay, when Gail returns, uh, we will ask her to strike that. Uh, any further discussion on this passage? Uh, Jim Coughlin, are you trying to come on to discuss? Um, can I comment? Uh, yes, I think we can do that. Sure. Jim, Jim right Coghlan, can I ask you to mute, please? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Susanna, yes? I am curious of the definition of significant and somebody commented that the inventory should be definitely left open and you know my my problem is is the whole Nahalem drainage and, and the Clatsop County part that wetlands haven't been delineated and I'm sure that there are wetlands out here but they're not going to be big ones but they would be significant I would contend for the river sure. and yes there's another piece in there too that I don't know about in here but in designating one out here for significant on private property property owners would want to know how it would impact them and I'm not sure how to do that. Um, this, I was just going to comment, but I think it's already been done on that last thing about having, of course, I moved it from the, um, of 
no conflicting uses to protect. The trouble is, is what does protection mean? And I think conflicting uses when the use is for uh, habitat and water quality and other things are defined, that a conflicting use, might that language might be important language. But as you said, you're going to wait till Gail comes back. Okay. Thank you, Susanna. Gail, are you I, back on with us now? I am, um, but I just got back on, so I did not hear what the question was. That that's okay. Um, so uh, we had we have a an amendment to the language, which is to strike uh, from comma uh, for which no conflicting uses have been identified from incompatible uses. So that sentence should end with statewide wetland inventory period. And I was wondering if that was some legal boilerplate that needs to be in there, or if that's okay to take that out and deal with it as identified below. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to open all my worksheets back up, so you're going to have to give me a moment. Sorry. Please. That's sorry. Right. sorry. No problem. We've we've got your screen um, frozen for all eternity uh, in the historical record, so we can still see what we expect you to be seeing. Uh, Jim Allegria, did you have comment? Yes, I have a quick comment on this. Uh, reading that clause again, it's a basic question is, are there such a thing as conflicting uses that are compatible uses? So are we unduly restricting ourselves? Because right now it's no conflicting uses from incompatible users. And so, so there could be some conflicting uses that are compatible with wetlands. I guess that's basically my question. You know, what what is a subset of which? Or are they essentially being redundant? Okay, so if we could backtrack for a moment, please, and uh, let me know what the amendment was, and then... Sure. Okay, thank so, you. So the amend amendment that we voted on was after statewide wetland inventory in the first sentence of wetlands goal uh, to strike comma for which no conflicting uses have been identified comma from incompatible uses so that it should end that sentence should end inventory period okay so the northeast committee had the same discussion at their meeting about removing that clause as well and I mean obviously I'm not an attorney but um, based on my reading of the OAR I think that needs to remain in there or, 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 okay, is, the, or, is, or is the intent just to pr protect every wetland everywhere from any possible incompatible use I guess I was thinking that, uh, the, uh, as you just said, it is goal language, and the conflicting or not is somehow sort of subordinate to the goal. But um, I, there definitely is resistance to changing that. And like I said, I, I admit that sometimes there are legal reasons for these phrases to be in there. And, and I think, as Susanna suggested, it may be helpful. Um, but as we're cleaning up language, I was just proposing that the amend or the motion is to end the sentence with inventory and take out that phrase. So we're just checking with you. I guess you're telling us that legally, given it's in the OARs, it should probably stay in our goal language. That's my recommendation, yes. Okay. Fair enough then, Andy, I guess as the motion make, oh, I don't know what the process is, but this might be a non-starter. Yeah, I think it's- Or a non-stopper. I think, uh, in a legalistic sense, we've we've already removed that language. It still appears on our screen, but uh, we've removed it at this point. Um, we can choose to put it back in. Uh, I think that that's a valid motion for us, but uh, that, as far as our procedure here, we've chosen to take it out. Uh, Cheryl, do you have comment? And then Jim. I would remind us that I, I think it's a good use of our time to agree 
on what our big goals are. And I think we are in consensus that we want that language out. I would encourage us to not get bogged down in the literal words on every one of these. Um, we are at 350. I think we have consensus on this number one. I would love it if we could move through policy two and policy three and hit our goal of being finished at 430 today. We will go over all of this again, if I understood what Gail was saying to us, six months from now. This is not the end. This is not closure. We don't have to be perfect today. We have to be in consensus of where we want to go. And we can nuance these words and sentences and commas in details to death later. <laughs> we just extended this by six months today, which concerns me. I, I think when, when you have, it's hard to retain people the longer it goes on. I would like for us to keep moving forward. I don't think we have to fine tune every word today. So, so I think, um, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Jim, if I, if I may interject quickly before we go on, I, I would say we, we certainly can reinsert language. I think Cheryl is correct that um, this language is not intended to be final anyway. It still goes through staff and goes through the commissioners before it becomes comprehensive plan. Uh, so especially in a case like this where uh, staff reflection uh, may may tell us that we need to have certain language in there, I think uh, that's a very valid use of, of staff prerogative to change language that needs to be changed for legal reasons. Uh, so we may not have to deal with that procedurally either. Uh, Jim, do you want to? I would I withdraw my hand because it is a little bit of wordsmithing, uh, Cheryl. Uh, but uh, I can just submit that later. Okay. Uh, so we we still have a motion on the table, which is to to broadly uh, strike policy one and approve uh, the wetlands goal uh, now as amend amended. Uh, as a substitute. Uh, is there any further discussion for that motion? Okay, seeing no hands, uh, no mics going off. Uh, is there any objection to us striking policy one and inserting wetlands goal as amended uh, in its place? Okay, seeing no objection, uh, Gail, I think we can uh, say that the recommendation of this group anyway is to strike policy one and to insert wetlands goal as you have it amended. So for policy two, policy two discussion, um, policy two states a 10 acre site within wetland site six shall be provided for gravel extraction. Um, on policy two, uh, there's a there's a staff note both in my copy and there's two staff notes there. Uh, is there any resolution to those questions uh, for staff? Yeah. So with regard to uh, who has control of the property, a portion of the property is under control of the Nature Conservancy. Um, I have not had a chance to ascertain whether or not there is still an active gravel extraction pit uh, on the property. Okay. So uh, so do we do not know whether this is a going concern or not. Is that a correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, do we have any motion uh, or discussion about what we should do with policy two today? Uh, Jim Allegria. Well, it's a basic question. Uh, obviously, that's a conflicting use. Uh, should we, as a unit, as a group, identify each conflicting use if it's readily identifiable or should we say that it's a conflicting use and do away with policy two any other discussion from the group even in answer to jim's question robert i i see your uh lips moving but i don't hear you i i just you know it, seems obvious but why is a gravel pit a conflicting use
because the gravel pit was there at the time that they determined this was a wetland that uh, was going into their inventory res resource inventory. And, and you can't have a gravel pit in a wetland, even though that's where they'd normally exist. Uh, not all. You know, if it seemed like a gravel pit is a consequence of a, a, a river action, you know, kind of like you'd, you'd expect uh, the Mechanicum River to be full of beautiful river rock. Uh, you know, it just seems like it, they go together. They're part and parcel of one other. Not that you like them, but anyway. Can I Cheryl? comment? Yep. Uh, Susanna, wait just a moment. Uh, Cheryl had her hand up as well. Cheryl? I would like to suggest that we wait for a little more information on policy two. We now know that part of it belongs to Nature Conservancy, but staff hasn't had a chance to check on what the situation is with the gravel pit. So, and again, we're going to revisit this in six months. So I'm fine for moving away from policy two for right now until we have additional information. Cheryl, is that a motion? <laughs> you want everything in the form of a motion, don't you? Yep. Uh, I move that we consider policy two at a later date when we have additional information. Second. Any any discussion on um, moving policy two discussion to a later date? Uh, Jim Allegria. Uh, I would like to have a broader discussion on should specific conflicting use a potential conflicting use be itemized as uh, this is just a generic discussion because if you say conflicting uh, use uh, we may need to identify what a conflicting use is i'm assuming that we have some definitions of a conflicting use i don't know that for a fact but is this a in, should we have conflicting uses itemized in a policy or should we just say it's a conflicting use and that's it And that will determine, the discussion on that will determine whether we should postpone policy two or not, or say it's, 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 an, it's really not relevant to, to even discuss it. I'd love for it to be on the glossary of what's a conflicting use. Right, I, I, that, that is really what, uh, what we need to focus on. So it, it is, um, it's in 660-1605, um, it's a really simple definition there anyway, which is a conflicting use is one which, if allowed, could negatively impact goal five resource a goal five resource site. Okay, I see local government shall identify. So what it really means to me, my interpretation is we do need to itemize it. So in that case, then I agree with Shell's recommendation. All right, Jim, I'm just, uh, or group, I'm just reading this quickly. Okay, so um, Todd. Uh, may I ask a question? Does, does this imply then that we need to uh, take the same level of detail for all the wetlands that are in the county? I think that's a reasonable question for Gail. Yeah, uh, that's that's really my the point that I was trying to ask uh, to yeah. get clarification on. Okay, so the the wetlands that you want to identify, and you can identify as many wetlands as you want, but then you have to go through this process of identifying conflicting uses. In when the original plan was adopted, um, and then we had the Duncan Thomas study in 1982. Uh, that study actually identified several more wetland areas than were actually included in the final Goal 5 inventory. 
So um, I guess that is a decision that the committees will need to make uh, in terms of how much um, time and effort and which what lens they want to identify and go through this process with. Can we take another slice at it, like looking at the conflicting use of aggregates? I mean, that seems to be the big one that's central. Is there a simpler way to come at it from the other direction? Like, like focus on the, the use of aggregate and make some language about that. I mean, aggregate is very, you know, it's important to have. Uh, uh, never mind. We're about ready to vote though, right? We are, um, and I apologize. I'm, I'm also looking at the, um, the 660 language at the moment that Gail has um, got up on screen and the following language. I, I'm not sure it's clear to me that this language is suggesting that we need to keep an inventory of conflicting uses or our recommendations at the comprehensive plan level within the comprehensive plan is that your reading of some section here gail sorry um so i'd have to go back and reread it i was in the process of making notes on on um some other comments so hold on a second okay uh, Cheryl, do you have comment as well at the moment? And I would still like to comment at some point. Oh, okay. Th thanks, Suzanne, for the Andy, reminder. Andy, do, do you want me to go ahead now? Um, sure, as, as we're waiting on Gail, sure. Okay. I just wanted to say that I agree with Jim's original comment, although he then went and took it back. Um, Jim does a nice job of, of giving us the overview, the big picture, and I appreciate his views and I appreciate his input. And I, I think the question that he was asking, I don't think we want to go through every single solitary wetland and list out what those, what those exceptions are, what those conflicting uses are. I agree with the big picture with where he was sending us. Therefore, <laughs> I'm now against reconsidering my policy to my motion for reconsidering policy two later. I'm now in favor of dumping policy two because I don't think we want to do that for every single identified wetland. Okay, so Andy, I think if I understood your answer correct or your question correctly, um, you're asking if we need to specifically list like they did in policy two every single um, conflicting use. Is that is that the question that I'm understanding? Yeah, yes, precisely. Okay, yeah, I don't think that we do, but I think that there are times when it can be beneficial when you do want to call out a specific site that so in this case, you've got two um, re resources, natural resources that mm -hmm. um, are in conflict with each other. So this is, I think, a specific example where you want to get very detailed in the comp plan, uh, because obviously there was a reason why they wanted to protect that. It was probably obviously something that was existing. So I don't think that you need to do that in every case, but right. I, I mean, so if you've got, if there's not a conflicting use, obviously you don't have to, but if there's something that you want to call out for specific protection, then you've got to, to list it as a policy. Is, is there a reason why it, uh, and this is procedural and, and maybe speculative, but is there a reason why, why it would be called out in policy and not in the uh, inventory section of the plan itself? So. You know, we've got it within the inventory. It says wetland site six and gives the description, et cetera. Is there any reason why it would need to be called out in policy here uh, the way we want it to be treated as opposed to uh, delineating things within the inventory? Okay, 
I cannot speak as to why they included things 40 years ago. I, I don't have that institutional knowledge. Sure, uh, and and I don't expect that. Um, I, I'm more asking: is there is there a uh, a legal or procedural reason that you know of uh, that it would carry more weight or be different uh, when it's struck out as a policy here as opposed to being put in the inventory? I don't know that I can answer that for you, Andy. Um, I mean, by putting it as a policy, I think it makes it more likely that you can then carry over and create some regulation around it in your zoning code. But it's still, whether it's on a map in the inventory or spelled out in language in a specific policy, the, the map doesn't show the 10 acre gravel site for one thing. So yeah, that's okay. pro probably part of why that they, they specifically put it in here to call attention to that specific fact that wasn't showing up on a map. Um, but again, I'd really, we'd really have to go back to if there were any recorded minutes or discussion from 1979, 1980. I don't even know if there is to really understand what the thought process was behind this decision. Sure. So I really, I really just can't answer a question like that for you. I just don't have that knowledge, and I don't know if I have even the um, the, the historical ability to go back and find the answer. Okay, that, that's a that's a fair answer. Um, Todd. I have a question uh, uh, regarding this. Are we charged with uh, augmenting this plan or are we charged with rewriting this plan? Because if we're charged with rewriting it, it seems that something like policy two, which we don't understand and we don't see any purpose for, should just be erased. Uh, and and like uh, Cheryl says, uh, I second her motion, by the way, to uh, delete policy two and move on. So so let me say that that is not the motion on the table at the moment, yep. though we can get to that motion. Um, this, I want to, Susanna, you, you had, have been patiently holding a comment. Well, I'm a little bit lost in the weeds. I, can I just ask quickly, what is the motion on the table? The motion on the table was to delay discussion of policy two until we got more information back from staff about the current um, status of wetland site six and gravel extraction and who owns gotcha. it. Gotcha. So, so go one, the one thing about gravel extraction that will be coming up under another part of goal five later on. But just again, a reminder that all the gravel that I know of is um, rock deposits that are blasted and crushed for gravel. That I don't know there's any longer any gravel bar use of rock. Tom Horning once said it's not good rock for gravel anyway that are in gravel bars, but I know nothing about that one. But um, it's really gravel extraction from gravel bars in rivers and creeks would be terrible for salmon impact on salmon spawning and just a whole host of problems. And they say, I don't think it's relevant because that's not where I don't believe any gravel extraction is coming from. But that would be addressed further down the road when we get to mineral resources. Um, and I just I think it is so important that it is never considered an appropriate use in riparian or wetland areas. Thank you, Susanna. So the the motion on the table to to just uh, remind here uh, is that we delay discussion of policy two, uh, which we've managed to discuss mostly within uh, the motion discussion. Uh, delay discussion of policy two until we get more data from staff uh, to make a determination. Um, I'll ask, is, uh, is there objection uh, to that motion within the group? Jim, I see your hand. Okay, uh, let's have a vote. Uh, I can see hands for everyone, but Cheryl, hopefully she can come back on. Okay, so I can see hands for I think everyone in the group. I'm, 
I hope I'm not missing someone. Um, all those in favor of the motion to delay discussion of policy two until we get more information from staff, uh, please raise your hands. Oh, okay, that's two. Uh, all those opposed to the motion uh, to delay discussion on policy two until we can get information from staff, please raise your hands. Uh, Robert, I did not see a hand either way. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, I I will tie break here and say that we should go ahead and have discussion of policy two. So that that vote is uh, three to two. Um, any further discussion of policy two? So we're still in discussion of policy two at this moment. Um, do we want to keep it, strike it? Uh, what would you all like to do with policy two? Jim Allegria. Uh, I would, it seems like we haven't heard any compelling reason to keep it. And there is a section to make note of it in the inventory section. So I would like to delete it. Okay, can you state that as second. a motion? Okay, oh, I'll uh, restate I'm, it as a motion since you got okay. a second. Uh, uh, Jim Allegria moves that we delete policy two, second by Robert Strickland. Uh, any discussion on deleting policy two? Uh, seeing no discussion, is there any objection to deleting policy two? Seeing no objection, uh, policy two we can delete, thank you. Okay, so uh, last one, uh, policy three. Uh, this is, I'm not gonna read all of this one because it's quite extensive and we probably go over our time limit. Um, so this is policy three uh, requirements for wetland site seven, uh, which is the Northeast site. Um, I think it's also, is it site nine? Uh, it's site nine in the comprehensive plan itself. Um, so that, that's a little bit of confusion that we might want to mark up um, just to note that it's got a different numbering system here and on the map than it does in the, uh, the comprehensive plan text itself. Um, but is there discussion on, on this policy, on policy three? Uh, have, we, have we met this goal? Should we retain it? Cheryl, am I, uh, go ahead, Pat. Is this going to be something that Crest is going to be looking into to provide us more information? Is this one of those sites? Gail or Nancy, do you have uh, feedback on that? Yeah, we did not specifically call out any particular sites. Um, when we met with Denise yesterday, we basically just talked um, about the identifying wetlands generally in the county and then focusing on specific ones we didn't ask her to go back and reevaluate specifically this particular site um, i don't know if denise and nancy have talked more since yesterday if she may have more information well i asked because there's a lot of language around this particular site that i'm unfamiliar with and there may it, it may make sense and it may not make any sense it's another one of those historic things that would be good to, to see if it's an issue to worry about Okay, Nancy, so the, the thing to keep in mind is that so this area that's being discussed in policy three is um, most of it is the Wana Mill site. Um, I think there may be a little bit of the Teven site, maybe not, um, but it's I think it's all Georgia Pacific property. So, and I think that language was put in there for a very specific reason because A, they were trying, understanding that there is a development already there, but then trying to protect certain areas that they wanted, uh, that they specifically called out for um, white-tailed deer habitat protection. So, um, I think there is a bit of history in there. I just don't know the exact history. And I would suspect that there are um, people on this committee who have been in the county much, much longer than I have who probably know more and could uh, elaborate. Does anyone care to take that baton? Cheryl?
as I mentioned in my uh, Northeast CAC report at the beginning, um, none of us had specific knowledge about this site, um, but I would just echo what Gail said. The language is very specific. Um, it is, I read it as being protective and it does contain whitetail deer habitat. So Andy will ask for it in the form of a motion. I move that we leave policy three, that we continue to include policy three as written, period. And then my comment to that is just my reminder that today is not the beginning and the ending of all of the language for every policy. We will revisit this again in six months. And I will be very interested to hear what the folks at Crest have to say about this. And I will try to get my little feet on that property so that I can see it and understand it better. Thanks, Cheryl. Is there a second for the motion? Jim, is that a second hand for second? Okay. So we have a motion uh, to retain policy three as written. Uh, is there any discussion of that motion? And if Crest comes back with other information, we can obviously make changes after that. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that this would limit your ability to change things after that. Any further discussion? Any objection to retaining policy three as written? Uh, Jim, is that objection? I, I have a, actually a comment rather than an objection. Okay. And uh, since we don't know enough about it to make an informed decision to actually include or delete, uh, I suppose, I would be opposed to keeping it, but instead have a, another motion. Maybe we should need to do this in two different pieces. One is to talk about the policy three, and then maybe uh, I could uh, submit a, a, a another motion. The, I don't know. If you want me to say the other note, motion is to make sure we revisit this. You know, I want it to be, I would like to see in the record that we will revisit this upon receiving additional information. I know we can always do that as a default, but I think if we specifically earmark it, it would be better. So I would suggest uh, that, um, that you can submit that as an amendment to the motion, that okay. uh, when we have additional information, we revisit, uh, examination of this policy three okay that'd be fine okay Second, so, if you need that. thanks pat so uh amendment as stated and seconded would be uh that we revisit discussion of policy three uh if and when we get additional information germane uh, to the policy any uh, objection to that amendment. Okay, the amendment. I just have a, a yes, tiny sir. query. You know, I I know that the Chinook Nation is highly concerned about the white tail deer habitat. You know, so that anything that uh, was describing this side of the highway, that side of the highway, that the deer wouldn't understand didn't make any sense to them either uh and so i'm i'm not sure how much of this gets into that of, of where the signs are made in clear deer language uh anyway but but, but I, I i think we're ignorant enough about this right now to not take action but any action i would take would try to be in support of the protective interests of the Chinook Nation. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so any, Gail, do you, you came off mute as well. 
Yes, I just have a question for clarification so I understand. Um, when you talk about additional information, are you referring only to uh, the information that Crest may provide regarding the site, or is there more additional information that you are looking for? Hmm. The Crest review would be adequate for me. Yeah, just, just additional information. I, I make it more generic. A fair, fair answer for you, Gail. Um, I was clear, and then Jim said that uh, he wanted more specific information to make it more generic, or I'm not quite understanding, I guess. I, I think I understood Jim to be meaning that, that any uh, information of significance pertaining to this site, regardless of source, would be sufficient to make us want to come back and talk about it. Thank you, Andy. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any objection to the amendment? We're still there, right? I think that's still where we're at. Okay, no objections to the amendment. So the motion as is, uh, is uh, we retain policy three um, with the proviso that if we get significant information about uh, wetland site seven, uh, that we will come back and revisit this discussion. Uh, is there any objection to that uh, motion? Okay, seeing none, um, thank you. We'll keep policy three in now uh, until we can uh, get more information on it. And if that happens, we will come back and re-examine. Um, I do wanna ask for uh, just, can you put in the margin there, Gail, uh, as a Scrivener's note, uh to reconcile the wetland site numbers uh between the this part of the document the policy part and the map and the inventory because i know they they don't all line up okay uh so the next item uh thank you all uh, the next item on our action items for today's meeting uh, conscious of the fact that we've got a little under 40 minutes until five. Actually, what? Yeah, five is the end time that we've got until. I know I want to get staff out of here and everybody before then, but. Gail, is that our, our cap time? Five o'clock. We've got closing comments at 4.30. Uh, I don't necessarily see an end time, though. Andy, it's Leanne. I don't hear from Gail, so I'll just say I looked at my calendar and it oh. says 5 o'clock. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, okay. Had my had my mute button on. I apologize. Oh, no, no problem. Uh, so is that accurate, uh, the information from Commissioner Thompson? That's your understanding as well, Gail? Well, we put five down. Um, obviously, if you had a lot of uh, closing comments or public input and ran over, we wouldn't cut off the meeting at five. Conversely, if you finish a little bit sooner because there are no more closing comments, we, we won't make you stay on the line till five o'clock. Okay, fair enough. Uh, thank, thank you for that answer. Um, so next action item uh, three, the C CCAC should recommend any wetlands within Flats of Plains area that are not currently included in the Goal 5 wetland inventory, but which should be. Uh, so this would be an opportunity if members of the committee uh, or the public uh, have significant information that would cause us uh, to include a new wetland or, well, existing, uh, but new to the comp plan wetland. Uh, into the inventory. This would be an appropriate time to talk about it for Clats of Plains. Uh, Robert, did anything uh, come up in your liaison group uh, to this end? And I think you're on mute. You're on mute. You know, what comes to mind is I've forgotten what difference between the really good, most recent uh state wetland identification process and the old stuff 
where a whole lot of wetland was left out on Classic Plains. So I'm I'm a little, you know, I'm, Gail can straighten me out very quickly on this. Uh, you know, it, it used to be there were lots of wetlands that were not deemed significant. And, you know, and then, then recently, this magnificent new combination of science that Jim would understand uh, came into play. I I don't know if that is considered part of our comp plan now, or if there has to be something that is yet to reconcile the, the two so that we de defer to the latest wetlands inventory information. So so can, can I ask Gail uh, as a continuation of that, are there any uh, wetlands in the SWI or NWI that are significant that are not included in the, the current inventory for class of planes? I have not done that uh, breakdown, so I, I cannot answer that question. Um, but to go back to Mr. Strickland's question, which now I've already forgotten. Um, it, basically, is, is there a matchup of oh, yeah, sure, uh, sure. Yeah, so current we, reality and the plan? Yeah, so we have not, we use the wetland, um, statewide wetlands inventory that's been approved by the state. We use it on our web maps, but it is not a layer that we have officially adopted in any manner. So we use it, um, we use it to send wetland notices off to the state when a development is proposed, but it's not something that's officially adopted by the county. Okay, thank you, Gail. Um, I had a hand from Cheryl and then Todd. A couple of questions. Gail, earlier you talked about the Duncan Thomas inventory. Is that different from the state wetlands inventory? Uh, yes, very different. So uh, the Duncan Thomas report is the one that was done in 1982, uh, out of which they picked the, the wetland sites that are in goal five right now. Um, the statewide wetland inventory is based on a uh, combination of information from the National Wetland Inventory, local wet, wetland inventories, and also based on soil types. So there's um, a lot more information and more up-to-date information on the statewide wetland inventory. But short of actually being on the ground and having a delineation done, um, that's probably the most accurate that we have right now. Okay, so two thoughts. Um, obviously, we need to look at the state wetland inventory and see what was identified in Clats of Plains that's not in this current plan that we have. And then um, secondly, is there any reason that recommending additional ones was limited to Clats of Plains? For instance, if in the state wetlands inventory, there were wetlands identified in Northeast, wouldn't we also be considering whether or not they should be included in goal five? Yeah, that was a typo on my part. Uh, we were putting out three agendas that week and I used the same memo, but didn't update all the language. So it should not just be specific to Clatsop County. We put that in the Clatsop Plains uh, CAC agenda. And so Northeast should have said Northeast and countywide should have said countywide. And so I apologize okay. for that. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that, Gail. So, so likely we're encouraging adoption, which hasn't happened, right? No, we have not adopted. Okay. Uh, I got Tom and then Pat, or Todd and then Pat, sorry. We have, this is a hot issue down in Southwest Coastal uh, because the statewide, uh, well, first off, there was a, a wetlands inventory commissioned for the Arch Cape area, uh, which was completed and is included in the statewide inventory, but has not been included in Clatsop uh, inventory. And the explanation was that Clatsop doesn't deal with wetland inventories, doesn't deal with wetland legislation or whatever. And therefore the state 
it's irrelevant whether it's included in the uh, CLADSIP inventory or not. Gail, what do you what do you say to that? Well, there are so many parts to respond to, but um, I think that um, it, it has not been adopted. The the local wetland inventory for Arch Cape was never adopted. If it were a, to be adopted and approved and accepted um, by the uh, County Board of Commissioners, then what could happen is that additional protections around those particular wet, wetlands could be uh, implemented. So um, I don't think that it's not that we we don't period and stop. I think it's that we haven't. I think that was part of what the advisory committee was looking at before it um, sort of informally dissolved back in 2017. And it is certainly something that could be considered again. Uh, I, I'm gonna go Pat and then Robert. I mean, one of the recommendations was for it to adopt that straightforward i mean so the work that a group did in 2017 could be really 2017 could be really instructive for us that's a no-brainer um i would think um what is maybe more threatening or weird i mean it struck me as odd that there were specific sites of wetlands in Clatsop county when it's a huge region of wetness that the wetland inventory suggests i mean i imagine it would be total heartburn just to adopt the wetlands inventory as the wetlands for the county and then work within properties after that for, I don't know, compliance. It just sounds like that would be, a, I don't know. Part of me would like to have that happen. Another part of me thinks that might be a counterproductive um, approach. What would the, have any other counties adopted the wetlands inventory as their county wetland inventory? I do not know the answer to that question. Would that give you heartburn though? Is that like, like a really, is that, I, I have a feeling that would be hugely controversial, right? I would suspect it would um, for many reasons, one of which being that um, as much enhanced as the statewide wetland inventory is, uh, much more so much more refined than the national was, um, it's not an actual delineation. And so um, you're really encumbering a, a lot of property based on yeah. no, not no ground truthing. Yep. Got it. My understanding is the up here class of plains was done first because it was so obvious and so important and they simply ran out of steam without ever doing it was not a matter of we don't want to do Todd's area and then later it was uh, the usual fight between do you plan or do you oppose planning and, and that's more where it has sat but it was it was not originally uh that arch cape is unimportant uh it was uh we'll start up here on clots of plains gail can i ask a, a staff question uh, is it possible for this committee uh to get the local wetlands inventories i know there's the arch cape one but uh it's noted in in the packet that at least Gearhart and Warrington have also done local wetlands inventories. Is it possible for us to get those for, say, the March discussion when we when we talk more in depth about um, what sites we might want to consider? Yes, we can do that. Thank you, um, Jim. I always thought that any kind of wetland delineation was essentially classified as potential wetlands. And if there is a proposal to uh, develop or have some kind of incompatible use, then that's when on the ground delineation uh, would be required um, based on set state guidelines on classification. So um, I don't think it's uh, appropriate to have hard delineation based on a state level map, which I'm sure is very informative but uh, on the other hand, uh, I think relying on, say, on a national uh, map would be way too gross. Uh, so is it possible for us to propose uh, the uh, state map as, as a potential wetland map uh, and, and subsequently uh, have ground-based inventory as, as needed to confirm or to not confirm uh, that it's a wetlands?
so there, the wetland delineations we see, there, there, you, when you have a delineation, you can have it done, uh, or you can send it off to Department of State Lands DSL for them to review and approve. So um, the the local wetland inventories that are um, in Arch Cape, Gearhart, and I think Cannon Beach and Warrington, those have been reviewed by DSL and approved. So they're actual, pretty much ground truth based um, boundaries that have been determined. Again, I'm, I'm, I have some reservations and it would be something I would obviously want to run by our county council um, about just wholesale adopting the statewide wetland inventory and then basing regulations on that um, because it is not ground truthed. And so then uh, I think what would happen would be um, you would have to then tell everybody who came in for development uh, who had a potential wetland on there that you would need to uh, have them get an approved delineation from Department of State Lands. And so then there would be some potential ramifications from that in terms of increased costs to property owners um, and things like that. So I'm I'm thinking off the top of my head about how this would be viewed um, from, from- I'm not seeing it past the, I'm not seeing it past the County Commission with a lot of enthusiasm given the implications. I, I I retract my good idea. I mean, I can certainly run it by county council and get her thoughts as well, and um, you know, report that back. But that that would be my initial thought. Yeah, my experience with the tsunami line would suggest that that would probably do more harm than good to even inquire, unless we're planning to do something really strong in this body. Okay, so this is an example. Um, of a, of a wetland delineation that was approved by Department of State Lands last year. And so they actually issue you a letter. The um, approval is good for five years. It can be renewed for a further, another five years after that. But the um, private property owner actually hired someone to go out and delineate the boundaries of the wetlands. Uh, it gets reviewed by Department of State Lands um, and then they will sign off and approve it. So. Um, it's it's a much more detailed um, description of the wetland boundary than you, what you'll see on the wetland map. So um, I, I can probably pull this up real quick to give you a comparison. Hold on. So the property that had the delineation done is this one right here. So this green is the wetland area that we show on our map. And you can see this is what they actually mapped out. So there's there's a bit of difference. So if you were to adopt this as your wetland layer and then say, well, you've got a 25 or 35 or 50 foot setback off of that line uh, that's not actually ground truth, then you know that's where you're going to run into some issues because the ground truth thing will tell you where it actually is as opposed to a generalized line on a map. Uh, yeah, no, Gail, uh, I wasn't suggesting to use the map as a given, using the uh, map as potential. So just that it would be uh, kick it into a ground truth exercise. Um, I don't know if that makes a, a difference from what you're saying. Yeah, so it, it would be different, but then again, you, you will be um, potentially creating extra costs uh, for property owners who are looking to do something with their property. And I, I say that in neither a good way or a bad way. I'm just merely throwing that out there as an observation of what would likely happen in, in the real world. Okay, uh, so I, I want to steer us back a little bit uh, to action item three, which was, uh, should we recommend any wetlands uh, within Clatsop County that are not currently included in goal five inventory? Um, 
but which should be. Uh, any any strong feelings from the committee on including new wetlands in the inventory? Or how we should go about doing that or which ones we should thought. I mean that's we were kind of talking about I think with, with using the maps. Um yeah, other uh to, to not add additional ones would be to say what was there in 1980 is the baseline. We go down from there to zero until the next Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, when which case the subsidence will bring all of our all of our wetlands back to um, where they were and then some, um, which gives me some hope, I guess, on this. So it's a downward spiral to all dry unless wetlands are somehow. I don't know. You can't add dry land to the wetlands, but it does seem like giving up to not consider any um, restored wetlands or restorable or no sense of increasing any wetlands seems depressing. Todd? Yeah, this is a this is an issue that comes up and uh, and it's beaten down by the argument that it makes no difference, that there's no purpose for going through the uh, process of adopting it in the count, adopting all the statewide wetlands in the county inventory. And I, I haven't heard really whether that's the case or not from this from the county. Maybe Gail could address that. I think that I said that I would be glad to check with county council about how that would play out and and whether that would be permissible. Okay. And, I, and, I, and I will look and see if there are any other counties who adopted uh, the wetland layer as their official wetland layer. And Great, thank you. Okay, Jim and then Pat. Well, maybe, maybe something up a, a little more palatable is to have the state wetlands map reviewed and um, significant and however you define significant wetlands be identified and work with those. That way there, uh, there could very well be a significant, uh, there could very well, very well be a lot of wetlands that aren't really critical that would be excluded from, from additional uh, wetlands protection. And what was my thought? Oh, um, adding on to that a little bit, um, you know, I read in the statewide guidance the notion of you know, restoring wetlands. Might there be also language about identifying maybe some of these not significant or highly functioning, but with some remediation could be made more functional, like a wetland bank, I suppose it is, but identifying in the plan that it would be encouraged whenever possible. Um, to identify parcels that could be newly emerging wetlands, if you know what I mean. So, so I think actually that fits in uh, nicely with four of on our action items, which is identifying issues in the comp plan around wetlands that we might want to say change or add policy. Um, would would be my take on that particular point. I think it's a reasonable one. Uh, that we should encourage, uh, but or if the group wants, we should encourage. Uh, but I think maybe in action item four, Robert. I have not heard the term newly emergent wetlands. You know, it's always seemed like it, it with global warming, it's the opposite direction. Uh, that you know, it's where it's eutrophying Smith Lake. It's you know, it's drying out of wetlands so i'm I, I i think it's great to be able to enhance them i i know we offered to the county uh many acres out here but it became uneconomical uh to for mitigation purposes to go do it but that, that's a side issue um in other words i i would have been happy to have had 40 acres of duck pond by scalping uh, two feet off the top, uh, and the county never officially told us that they weren't going to do it. But that's a totally side issue. Can I comment? So, uh, ju just one second, Susanna. I I, I want to note uh, because I think it, at least based on Gail's screen here uh, that we might be starting to go into item four. 
um, that uh, for item three, to, to summarize maybe some of what I've heard that uh, we wanted to see some of the local wetland inventories like the Arch Cape uh, in inventory. Uh, we wanted to see uh, what the state wetland inventory had in store to, to compare and, uh, and possibly try to pick out significant wetlands that were not included in our current inventory. Uh, did, did I miss anything? Uh, any other sources that we're looking to, to bring back into this discussion for future? And possibly, I guess, any information that Crest comes back with as well, if it, um, if it would pertain to new wetlands or wetlands not included in our inventory as opposed to new. Does that yeah. sound reasonable as a summary? Okay. Well, I, I, I do want to comment though. Uh, okay, go ahead, Susanna. When there is, um, I mean, DSL, you can make a co commitment to mitigate and create other wetlands, um, enhance wetlands to offset fill in wetlands or just fill permits. And those are the ways I think that wetlands are being created sometimes. And if they're being created, they need then to be in the inventory. Actually, I think, um, so one of the, thank you, Susanna, for the comment. I think uh, that's something to keep in mind, especially if we want to look at the task force recommendations. Uh, one of them is uh, tr trading uh, and whether or not uh, things would play into, into that calculation for policy in that way. Um, do you, uh, as a group, do you want to move to, uh, Action item four, which is uh, new issues and policies. Do you want to discuss further uh, Pat's idea that, that Gail started to take down or discuss other policies that we might want to include? And, uh, and, include, and I would say that discussion should uh, possibly include with the task force recommendations that were brought to uh, County Council in 2017. Um, are we ready for that discussion? in our last 13 minutes. Give it a go. Okay. Uh, Gail, do you mind going over to the policy sheet again? And we can discuss this one briefly. Do, uh, so, thank you. Uh, so for, for Pat's, uh, I, th I think newly emergent wetlands or, um, Potential for wetland mitigation is what I was thinking. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. All right, Robert, any clarification. You know, when I said I hadn't heard of emergent wetlands, I I certainly know that uh, north of the Seaside Airport, uh, a lot of land over east of McCormick Gardens Road did wind up uh, mostly flooded. You know, where you'd wind up with what used to be usable land wound up to where you just had a tiny house on a little tiny knoll. So, so things have changed, uh, you know, so, so those you could call newly emergent, but it was more from someone following up the drainage patterns. And just to be clear, newly emergent, I mean, I was, I was really pointing towards um, and not those little small areas, but potential areas that willing landowners could create new wetlands um, that then would mm -hmm. be built. So that's clarification. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim. Uh, Patrick, would this include areas that are currently diked and was previously uh, wetlands and as an aspirational document? Well, as an aspirational document, uh, to try to identify those. And again, with willing landowners, uh, we have a number of different organizations here that we may be able to entice mm -hmm. to work with the landowners to come up with some something, not necessarily a sale, but something like that to restore those wetlands uh, to what they originally were. Hmm. I like my general notion of, of, of identifying potential wetlands wherever they are where willing landowners would want to expand them for credits or otherwise. Um, right. I, I guess I'm a little queasy about talking about the dikes um, just because it brings in the whole flooding issue and goal seven things as well. So I'll step back from, from that 
because I don't know that I know enough about it. In general, I think where they can be produced, it would be great to be. Maybe eliminate the word dikes, just restore wetlands, something like that. I'm comfortable. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if bringing in the dike territory and putting wetlands behind dikes is somehow counterproductive, or I, I don't know enough about the structures and how that works to be enthusiastic about that, other than generally supporting, um, creating, maintaining, and creating wetlands wherever possible. Yes, our air, airport could be used for flying boats. This is just me, but you know, again, when I think of even freshwater wetlands in Clatsop County, there are oftentimes um, the same areas that are in a tsunami inundation zone. And there are a number of things that cross over with goal seven that, you know, so there's a lot of overlap. So I'm glad that we're kind of revisiting these things because some goal seven flags come up with wetlands. Also things like goal one, public participation, and maybe some thinking going back to that goal about disclosure of sales sales of property to actually identify things that need to be disclosed of such nature like tsunamis and wetlands and things like that. So um, in thinking about these goals and trends, they've crossed with me with goal seven issues as well as goal one issues. I'm not sure exactly how to capture those. Um, but anyway, those are my thoughts. I'll be quiet. So one thing I want, I want to touch on quickly um, and just get a sense of especially and maybe right now because of time issues we just want a sense of whether we want to come back to one or not but there were um there are four items out of that 2017 advisory committee um that they brought to the county commission i don't know if if you've all had time to review those or the testimony as given um the first was a uh, countywide transfer of development rights program um, I I don't know that I know the details about the the one that they note in Clats of Plains that already exists, but apparently they were using that as something of a model that they wanted to streamline. Do we want to come back to that as a group to discuss it more uh, as a uh, as a recommended option or a policy? I'm just trying to sort of get a sense of of what we should include for future agendas. I do. I think if a group of people like us did some work like that in the in the past and they came up with solid language such as transferable development rights and the enhanced the notification program, I would definitely like to know what the status is, if it's still useful and it seems like low hanging fruit to keep moving forward if staff would concur. Okay. And uh and so that you included your comment for for one uh, and two of theirs, which is the transfer of development rights and the notification pr uh, program. Uh, are Robert and Jim, are you happy with us coming back uh, to discuss those two items in the future? Okay, I see yes. a couple yeah. of nods. Uh, the the third item was the uh, inventory from Arch Cape uh, uh, for wetland and riparian corridor uh, to take those th that inventory through the adoption process. I think that's substantially already included in, in some of the discussion we've had as far as bringing that inventory in for us to look at in, in future meetings. Um, there, were, there were some things uh, that were getting into uh, development code uh, and low impact development. Uh, is that an issue that we want to come back and, and review as well? That was uh, number four in their agenda item summary. I'm trying to see if I don't I don't am I mistaken Gail I don't believe that they did a they didn't do an attachment for that item did they no they did not okay so uh it, is there interest in going into this uh in detail uh, again we don't necessarily have the the background material like we have the attachments for the other three uh, they give us a pretty good level of detail of what they talked about. Do we want to examine development code uh, things in, in our work? Um, I, I would be, right, right now I am uh, woefully uh, uninformed. Or, and so um, 
for us to tackle for, then definitely would be at another time. So we'd be able to look into it uh, more thoroughly. Okay. I'm I'm not necessarily seeing a enthusiastic uh, pull for, for that particular items, but the other three, it seems like we definitely want to come back and talk about in, in one way or another. Okay. Um, I... I know that we had in our uh, action items for today, uh, riparian corridors, um, both policy-wise and looking at the inventory there. Uh, obviously, I don't think we have time uh, for those particular items. Uh, I did note that they were on uh, Gail's extended plan uh, or extended calendar. Uh, so we'll be coming back to those areas uh, in the future. Um, I do want to give a, a little bit of time here. Uh, we, we've had sort of public comment throughout, but uh, anyone from the public have a sort of closing comment for us before we sort of wrap up our agenda for today? Okay, I'm not, not hearing any. I, hearing any. I appreciate the opportunity. Never stand between a chair and his gavel at the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, any closing comments from the group? Anybody want to make wrap, wrapping up comments? Can I, can I just say just to keep the Jewel area, the Halen River area open for more riparian Look, you know, research. Yes, I. Uh, we will do that, Susanna. And thank you for uh, keep keeping us to task on that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Get Gail. Uh, do you have closing comments from staff or or any administrative items that we need to know about for next meeting? Nothing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have. Uh, brusquely gotten through the items on our agenda for today. Uh, thank you all for your for your patience sticking with us till almost five o'clock. Um, like I said, we've we've got a couple of action items that we're going to need to cover in the future, but I think we we did some pretty good work today. So thank you all. Um, we will consider this meeting adjourned. See you next time.